Welcome back to the show, part of ESPN's Enterprise Unit. You can catch him often on Outside the Lines, E60, uh, reporter John Barr. John, thanks so much for the time today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. This is a big weekend for you. Uh, on Monday night, you have a new special airing on E60, uh, The Paterno Legacy. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, I guess around midpoint last year, uh, producer Michael Shallow came to me with the idea of revisiting the Jerry Sandusky scandal uh, and, and actually really revisiting Joe Paterno's legacy and, and where it stands today, viewed through the lens of the scandal that led to his downfall uh, back in 2011. And, uh, you know, there's been so much written. There have been, there was, there was the, you know, free report that was, commissioned by the school. There were rebuttals to the free report. There were multiple civil and criminal proceedings related to the case. And, you know, my first instinct was, geez, do we really want to get back into those waters? But the more we got into it, the more we realized how much rich detail there was and how the aftershocks of the scandal were still being felt. At the, at the time we started reporting the story, Graham Spanier, the former president, for example, had yet to serve his time in jail. And ultimately, we, we wound up when we wound up interviewing him, he was still under home confinement. Uh, you had Jerry Sandusky, who was still trying to work every angle to appeal his uh, ultimate conviction uh, back in 2012. And then you had this dynamic where the winningest coach in major college football history had been essentially erased from any you know, other than his name being on the library, there, there's nothing that you can find on the Penn State campus today that speaks to his contributions to that football program where he was employed for 61 years. And, you know, we, I was there when the statue came down. So there was, I certainly had a connection there. I did a lot of reporting on the ground when the Penn State scandal broke. And, you know, the more we got into it, the more we realized how much rich detail there was and, and how the school was still kind of grappling with the idea of how to reconcile its past. What, what was your biggest takeaway about what they were grappling with and how they are going to bring this finally to a conclusion if they can? You know, I don't, I think the, the position they've arrived at and, uh, you know, I can't say I blame the school uh, is that they're dealing with it by really not dealing with it in, in February of 2020, the school, uh, released a statement saying, announcing that it had resolved any outstanding issues with the paternal family. At the time, the chairman of the school's board of trustees put out a statement where he made favorable comments about uh, Joe Paterno and the school put out a statement with language that really distanced, distanced itself from the free report, which was the report the school paid for. Uh, you know, but it, it sort of, I guess in a, in a nod to the critics of the free report decided to distance itself somewhat from that report. And the, the central findings of that free report for those who have forgotten uh, were that uh, senior leaders at Penn State, most notably the former president Graham Spanier, the former vice president of finance Gary Schultz, the former athletic director Tim Curley, all of whom went to jail and Joe Paterno who was never charged with anything, those four men were part of this effort to conceal Sandusky's crimes in the interest of protecting the reputation of the school. Uh, so you had this situation in February of 2020 where the school distanced itself from those findings, uh, but that was it. And there was really never any you know, tangible way that the school paid tribute to Joe Paterno. I'm not suggesting there should be, but there are still a number of people, there's a, there's a very broad swath of the Penn State alumni, mostly older, who believe the school should acknowledge him in some way, shape, or form. You mentioned the Paterno family in 2020, them sort of making up, but it, it didn't seem like Jay felt they all made up in the preview teaser. Can you talk about how the family feels about this all from your conversations? Yeah, so Joe Paterno had five kids, and you know, the interesting thing is the paternal family is still very much a part of that state college and Penn State community. Jay Paterno is on the board of trustees. Uh, Mary Kay, his older sister, uh, has a job with the College of uh, Liberal Arts. And Sue Paterno, who is now 82, remains a very active uh, fundraiser for Penn State University 
to this day. And she works for a variety of causes, the fawn, the famous, you know, dance uh, fundraiser that the school has each year, uh, also the, the food bank. So the school, the, the paternal family is still very much a part of that university. And uh, that, that was interesting to me. Uh, and, and perhaps not surprising, they went there, <laughs> they were raised there, uh, they planted roots there, they raised kids there. So really, you know, despite the fact that their father had an unceremonious exit from the school, and there, there's still some raw feelings related to that, they're still very much connected to the school. You had the opportunity to speak to a, a lot of the people that were firsthand parties in this, including, as you said, people that were convicted of crimes. What was your takeaway from talking to them? And, and do they do they attempt to just say they didn't do anything, or do they say there's an excuse for doing something? How did how did they handle it? And, and what were your takeaways yeah. from that? It was a mix. So ultimately, four people went to either prison or jail as a result of their roles in the scandal. You know, the most infamous, infamous one being Jerry Sandusky. He's at a low security prison uh, a couple hours from State College. Uh, it's essentially a geriatric facility for older male inmates. He's 78. He's not eligible for parole till he's 98. Jerry Sandusky continues to maintain that he's innocent. Um, he has constructed this what I like to refer to as a alternate reality in his mind, where all of the men who say that he was that he sexually assaulted them as as boys, that all of them are essentially uh, propagating a lie, uh, and you know his, in his construct, these men were convinced that they were sexually assaulted, and opportunistic civil attorneys then latched on and tried to get, and in, in many cases did get, large uh, financial settlements from the university. So that's Sandusky. Former President Graham Spanier remains defiant to this day. He, he says there was no effort to conceal. Remember there was that uh, now infamous shower incident involving former quarterback and former graduate assistant, Mike McQuarrie who came to Joe Paterno in February of 2001 and reported what he'd seen in the showers. There's great debate about just what he told Paterno, uh, but based on the thousands of documents we looked at and in speaking to, you know, dozens of people, uh, it's my belief that, that he clearly conveyed to Paterno that something inappropriate of a sexual nature happened and Paterno said as much to state prosecutors. Um, when that was then kicked upstairs to the president Spanier, the vice president Gary Schultz and the athletic director Tim Curley, those three guys came up with a plan of how to handle it. And ultimately, they initially they were talking about reporting it to the proper authorities, the, the Department of Public Welfare, but then they backed off of that and they didn't report it. Graham Why? Spanier, well, Graham Spanier to this day maintains that it's because he never got a report that something of a sexual nature happened. Gary Schultz, the vice president, his position for years was that he thought they did report it, he, you know, but, but when confronted with the evidence that they didn't report it, uh, you know, he now expresses regret. In, in our interview, he, of, of the three individuals we spoke with, Tim Curley declined to speak with us, the former athletic director, but of the three individuals we spoke with, Gary Schultz was really the only one to express real regret that they did not report this incident to the Department of Public Welfare. Graham Spanier, to this day, maintains that he did not get a report that suggested anything of a sexual nature occurred. Interestingly enough, there was another report <laughs> back in 1998. We don't even get into this in our story, but there was another report where Sandusky was uh, investigated by the police and ultimately a, a district attorney took a look at it and decided not to file charges. You know, that report was sent to Graham Spanier via email and he he says to this day he doesn't even recall that incident that that would have been when jerry sandusky was the active defensive coordinator for penn state university so in, by all accounts the people we spoke with said graham spanier was a micromanager who was invested in the smallest details of projects around the school so it takes a, a bit of a stretch to believe that he wouldn't be aware that his defensive coordinator was being investigated by the cops for 
an incident where he was involved in, in, in being in the shower with a minor boy. Uh, but there's a lot there. And, uh, you know, it was interesting to catch up with these men uh, years after their, in, uh, you know, charges. And in, in Spaniard's case, it was still really fresh. He had just gotten out of jail and he was still wearing an ankle bracelet because he was on home confinement. You know, you mentioned all the different people you spoke to and we all have friends who either went to Penn State. I have family that went there. I rooted for them growing up. There is people take sides. If you're either we Joe should be honored and and a part of it, or Joe should be exiled. What is his legacy after this piece for you? Well, I I hope people will come away from this piece thinking uh, we treated him fairly. But I also think that if we did our job, people will come away from this story a little conflicted about how they should feel about Joe Paterno. You're quite right. There are absolutely camps to this day. There's, there are those people who have 409 bumper stickers, those people for whom Joe Paterno was part of their childhood. Uh, you, you know, the man was there for more than six decades, for goodness sakes, 46 seasons as a head coach. Uh, you know, so he, he influenced generations of players and generations of fans grew up with him as a constant. Uh, but then you have uh, this other collection of people who, you know, as, as you said, believe he should be exiled and that the university should move on. And then there's a, a completely separate group of people for whom he's not even relevant. You know, that's one thing we found on camp. We, we actually found students on campus today who don't know who Joe Paterno is. I was and, wondering that because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do, but I wonder how much kids who came after when the statue was down were 10 years after all of that, how many just don't know about it? They were, you know, what? You can find them. Old? You can absolutely find them. I think about it. If you are a freshman or sophomore at Penn State today, you were probably what, like eight, nine, 10 years old when this scandal happened. And so if you grew up in a household where, you know, you didn't have parents who went to Penn State and took you to Penn State games, and you didn't, you didn't have any sort of, uh, you know, legacy connection to the school, then yeah, you arrive at Penn State, you don't see any sign of the guy, his name's on the library, but you, you, you can see how in someone's world, who comes from that background, they wouldn't have any frame of reference for Joe Paterno. And for those people, he's just not relevant. And, the, and they've, you know, and, and the people who are aware of the history of Penn State and Penn State football, a lot of them uh, have just moved on. So the, the job of a good reporter is to kind of not be part of the story. As a reporter, though, when you're doing a story that's this heavy, how hard is it to remain unbiased and, and not have emotions as you're doing the story? Well, look, I think that, you know, I've, I've had a, uh, just through the work that I've done at ESPN, I've had an opportunity to, to work on a number of stories that um, deal with uh, the sexual assaults of minors. And uh, that is always a uh, difficult subject matter. And I think one of the more poignant uh, moments in this story was when we heard from uh, Aaron Fisher, who was the very first uh, person abused by Sandusky to come forward. He was 15 when he made the courageous decision to tell his story, first to uh, state psychiatrists and then uh, ultimately to the state police. And it was Aaron coming forward that led to the investigation that brought everything down. And, uh, you know, so, you know, hearing from people like that, uh, you know, you, you, it's, it's, it's heavy subject matter and you just want to treat people like that with respect and, um, and hopefully present it in a way where you can convey the severity of what happened without going over the line and being uh, exploitive in any way. Um, and then, you know, just interviewing Jerry Sandusky was a completely different dynamic that he, there were limitations in terms of just how we interviewed him. He, he had to call us from prison. We were sitting in his lawyer's office the, the phone calls could only last 15 minutes. And then after and it, 15, it said, it's a collect call from Jerry Sandusky. Exactly, yeah. And then after the 15 minute phone call, there, there was a 45 minute waiting period until he could call again. And we never were sure if he was going to call again. So ultimately we wound, we wound up speaking with him three times that day. And then a, a fourth time. So I had an, an hour to speak with the guy and, uh, that's just a completely different animal uh, as far as interviews go. Um, you know, Jerry was very 
in, in his very first phone call to us, it was clear to me he was reading from a list of talking points. And, uh, you know, after our phone call, he shared with somebody who put it out on social media that, that we attacked him. Uh, I don't think we attacked him. He, he was trying to read a list of talking points and that's not an interview. I just, I knew I had to take control of the interview and start asking him questions or else the thing was gonna go south and we only had 15 minutes. So, uh, you know, I, I stopped him, I interrupted him and I did what I think a, a reporter should do in those circumstances. So every interview was different and, uh, and sort of brought up a different set of emotions. Uh, but yeah, you just, you just try to go into all of them being fair. Oh, we're sure you treated it with the same respect and, and tasteful approach that you do all of these very difficult but necessary subjects to cover. Uh, there'll also be a written piece out that you'll accompany with the E60 piece. There'll be another ESPN platform. Everybody should check it out Monday night, even if it's not the easiest topic to watch. It's an important issue to be aware of. John, thanks so much for the time. We always appreciate you with what you do in the work and the time you give us to talk about it. Gentlemen, thanks so much. I appreciate your interest.